he erected an immense How? Almost 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. Are you a homosexual? Jehovah's Witnesses have the best life ever. And don't believe me? This new JW broadcasting is gonna change your mind. But remember, if you cringe, you lose. And when you lose, comment the exact moment you lost it. Are you ready for this month's spiritual food? Let's begin. Welcome to JW Broadcasting. What's in store for us this month? If you've ever struggled with feelings of inadequacy, you'll relate to the experiences of Francis, Diego, and Carla. Hmm, I wonder if these feelings of inadequacy will be born out of the pressures from the world or out of Watchtower's never-ending hamster wheel. As Jehovah's servants, nothing brings us greater joy than worshiping the true God. But we are also human. I'm literally a talking panda. This means that from time to time, any of us can, and probably will, experience unsettling moments, times when we question our worth. For example, have you ever wondered about your true value in Jehovah's eyes? Not after leaving the cult, no. That question hasn't even crossed my mind, to be honest. Have you ever experienced moments of anxiety about your place in his organization? Nope, my anxiety levels dropped considerably after becoming inactive. Or have you struggled with feelings of worthlessness? Not often, no, because my worth is no longer tied to what I can do for an invisible, perpetually silent deity. Now I can decide my own worth based on the meaning I choose. <laughs> you should try it sometime, Mark. It's really nice. Disquieting thoughts. These can arise from... Factors such as guilt over the fact that we cannot do more in the ministry or in the congregation. Fear of the future, of being separated from the ones we know and love. And despair from being overlooked, feeling that we don't really matter. Yep, these are all problems caused by Watchtower, who would have thought? Disquieting thoughts are real and can overwhelm us at times. They can rob us of our inner peace and our sleep. And if we're not careful, they can even stifle our prayers, damaging our relationship with Jehovah. Nothing would make Satan happier. Here we go again, reading the mind of the devil. Maybe Mark sat down with Lucifer before delivering this broadcast and asked him, Hmm, what would make you happy, Satan? And Satan was like, Oh, I would love it if the prayers of witnesses were stifled. That really turns me on. Yeah, that's the canonical voice of Satan, by the way. We never want that to happen, especially now, since this old world is so near to closing. So near to closing? You mean being utterly annihilated by your overlords? So what can help us to soothe these disquieting thoughts? Leave the cult. Just kidding, Mark. Go ahead. Tell us how the source of our anxiety will also be the cure. In this month's broadcast, we will find the answer in a heartwarming prophecy. We hope that this inspired message will provide a strong scriptural basis to help you to dispel any feelings of inadequacy. Which prophecy? Well, please open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 56. Here we read of one of the most touching expressions of Jehovah's appreciation for two groups of people. Both groups wanted to serve Jehovah, but under the Mosaic law, they were limited or even disqualified from fully participating in Jehovah's arrangement for pure worship. Hmm, I wonder what kind of cruel individual would institute a law that bans certain people from worshiping the one true God over things that they had no control over. Hmm. Who were they? Did you notice the two groups? Foreigners, or non-Israelites, and eunuchs, men who physically could not produce children. Men who had their balls cut off. Come on, Mark, say it like it is. Don't be so prudish. They faced very difficult and possibly disheartening circumstances. During Isaiah's time, uncircumcised foreigners were allowed to live in Israel, but they had no permanent ties with the nation. Because of their status, they could not eat of the Passover meal. And as a protection, the Israelites were not to associate closely with them. Yeah, how dare these men not cut the foreskin off their penises, evil bastards, trying to corrupt the freshly circumcised Israelites. 
But many foreigners came to love Jehovah, converted to pure worship, and served Jehovah alongside his people. They were called proselytes. Nevertheless, even they could not fully become part of the nation of Israel. How would you feel if you were a foreigner alive at that time? Mark, how is this relevant to our discussion? This is all pure speculation. Your biggest fear would be getting cut off from God's people. Nah, I think my biggest fear back then would have been being assaulted by robbers or being massacred by an invading tribe or by some wild animals. I don't think being excluded from the circumcised boys club would be at the top of my head, Mark. Might you have disquieting thoughts at times? Consider the second group. Isaiah mentioned eunuchs. These were men who had their reproductive organs removed. It was the custom of Eastern pagan nations to make eunuchs out of some of the male children taken captive in war and then assign them to serve as trusted officials in royal courts or in other settings. Sheesh, what kind of horrible person would call for the needless mutilation of someone's genitals? Evil pagans. Okay, enough testicle talk. Come on, Mark. Get to the point. Because they were eunuchs, they could not become fully-fledged members of the congregation of Israel. Plus, at that time and in that culture, they suffered great humiliation in not being able to father children. And I'm sure the God of the Bible had no hand in perpetuating this patriarchal mindset that caused the eunuchs so much suffering, right? Sand is one of the most common substances on the earth. To us, it typically looks bland and ordinary. Each particle identical to the next. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. Like the psalmist, the foreigner, the eunuch. No matter the circumstances, when you humbly serve Jehovah, when you try your best, your work is never fruitless. Until it is. Until you spend decades of your life in the ministry without making a single convert. That's the definition of fruitless. What was the lesson Mar in Mark's talk again? <laughs> you're valuable to Jehovah even if your balls were cut off or if you still have a foreskin because sand? Now we jump into lessons from the watchtower where we get a few experiences of JWs who are giving their very best but still torment themselves because of what they can't do for the cult. Some time ago, I began to suffer from kidney failure. So it felt like I wasn't doing anything anymore. Some years ago, I started suffering from severe anxiety attacks, and that really affected me in the congregation. I started to compare myself to others, and I did the same with my parents. When my health problems began, I started comparing myself. I began thinking about what I was able to do before and about how my activity had gone down. Best life ever, folks. I've learned that comparing myself to others is very damaging, and it was bringing me down spiritually. Yeah, it's hard not to compare yourself with others when the likes of Samuel Heard are constantly pushing you to do more. But I'm just a little old sister who finds it hard to squeeze out a word of encouragement to others. Then this really helps me understand that I do have a role in the congregation. Yes, your role is to keep quiet in the congregation and avoid questioning the men. Their stories remind us that sometimes our circumstances change unexpectedly, throwing us off balance. Has that ever happened to you? If so, pay close attention to this next dramatization. In reality, those guys would be standing next to the cards looking super bored. Caring for the needs of my family is a source of great joy. That was the life that was. One drunk driver and my wife 
was gone. Our two children had lost their loving mother. The doctors were hopeful that my son might regain the use of his legs. My fellow elders were loving and considerate too. They offered to lighten some of my congregation responsibilities. But I just wanted to keep busy. I tried to keep on top of everything. But spiritually, things began to slip. On more than one occasion, I had to ask others to cover my meeting parts. Let's just take a moment to think. How much time is consumed each week by the meetings? Three hours for the midweek meeting, three hours for Sunday meeting, at least two hours to prepare for the meetings, two hours to prepare and carry out family worship, two hours for the ministry, if you're being generous, that's at least 12 hours a week dedicated to theocratic activities without counting personal study and shepherding visits. What could this man do with those 12 extra hours of free time per week? Maybe he could use that free time to relax or be with his family or go to the park or literally do anything else to improve his mental health. But no, his schedule is already packed and Watchtower squeezes every waking hour from him anyways. No wonder he's feeling that shit. Hi Simon. Oh, hi Oliver. I'm so sorry. I've been held up at work again. Could you cover the treasures item for me tonight? Okay. No problem. I'll see what I can do. Thank you. I was just too tired to prepare for family worship. And the results were obvious. Everything seemed overwhelming. Even the simple things were a struggle. The meeting was great. But that you missed Madison's demonstration tonight. You have to be fucking kidding me. The audacity of this kid. Y your dad is working his ass off to put food on the table while you lounge on your wheelchair. And you roast him because he missed Madison's cookie cutter presentation we've seen a million times before? Fuck off, kid. I'm so sorry. I had to work late. Don't worry, Dad. Something had to give. Maybe I needed to step aside as an elder. Yup, sounds like a perfectly reasonable response to your situation. I wonder if Watchtower is gonna let him off the hook. I needed help. So I reached out to a good friend, Simon. I explained everything. He really listened. He empathized and commended me for my efforts. Then shared Philippians 1.10 with me that you may make sure of the more important things. Oh my Oliver, God. It's especially during challenging times that we need to make sure of the important things. And the key to doing that is balance. Come over here. Simon used a simple illustration that changed my perspective. Just as a wheel can be out of balance, a sudden change in our circumstances can put us out of balance. But skilled mechanics can use small weights to rebalance the wheel. The machine told Simon where to position the small weight so that the wheel could run smoothly again. I got the point. Regaining balance might not involve big changes, just a few smaller ones. Not even Jesus himself would be able to come up with these illustrations. Balance comes when we exercise faith. What does that even mean? I realize that my family's spiritual needs are one of the more important things. And it's okay to ask others for support.
It seems that not even going paralyzed will spare you from the duty of spreading propaganda. Applying these Bible principles helped me regain my joy. Our circumstances may change, but our Christian priorities do not. They keep us anchored to our living hope. My mom. Why did she draw a black family again? Thanks to Jehovah, I was able to provide for my own in the most important ways. Oh look, it's my cousin. Next, we go into a few interviews of African JWs who suffer from albinism. Albino people in Africa suffer from extreme prejudice. Some have even been hunted down because their body parts are believed to be good luck amulets. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic that doesn't really fit into the broadcast that much. Mere man sees what appears to the eyes, but Jehovah sees into the heart. He also looks into your groin area to make sure your balls are intact. Okay, I'll stop now. Jehovah will comfort us if we draw close to him and our brothers. That's the topic of this month's new music video. It's called Draw Close to Me. Are you ready for the music video, kids? If you haven't cringed yet, now's the time. Please watch and enjoy. He says, draw close to me, close to me, and I'll draw close to you. I'll help you see, help you see, the good that I see. If you draw close to me Close to me Close to me And I'll draw close to you I'll help you see To me. Oh, come on. In real life, that lady would have probably opened the letter, said, Hmm, how weird. Do I even know this woman? Threw it in the rubbish bin and moved on with her life. Silly watchtower. Being indoctrinated into a cult will make you enjoy washing dishes, guaranteed. And now he's just a prayer away. My God, eternally. Damn, Brazil has been on a roll these past few months. I see who Watchtower is trying to target now. I'll draw close to you. I'll help you see, help you see the good that I see in you. If you draw close to me. I spent all my life waiting for Armageddon to come and now I'm at death's gate. Now it's your turn to indoctrinate the future generations. Caralho. Now we're gonna receive a glorious talk from your favorite cult leader, Stephen Lett. Jehovah can give us not just comfort but also strength. Notice how that's highlighted in this talk by Brother Lett. The theme for my discussion is never let Satan 
intimidate you. To intimidate means to try to get someone to do or not do something by bullying, terrorizing, threatening them. Oh, thank you, Master Stephen, for teaching an illiterate fuck such as myself the meaning of the word intimidate. What would I do without you, Stephen? And of course, Satan is a god of intimidation. That's one way he tries to get people to do what he wants. On the other hand, Jehovah always motivates by love. If by love you mean the threat of death, then yes, Stephen, love. Think of Goliath, who was nine and a half feet tall, trying to intimidate young David. Remember what he said to him? 1 Samuel chapter 17, he said, Just come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the heavens and to the beasts of the field. Just come to me, little boy, and I'll feed your corpse to the buzzards and hyenas. Big time intimidation. But of course, Satan, as we said, tries to still use intimidation today. Uh, if you don't take this blood transfusion, you will surely die. How is that even a threat from Satan? It's a medical advice from a professional that wants to see you well. The nonsense that comes out of this asshole's mouth could potentially lead to someone's death. It's not even funny anymore. If you don't accept this job, talking about a job that will damage you spiritually, your family will starve. No boss in the history of bosses has ever said that. What kind of Looney Tunes world are you living in, Lent? Why won't you smoke this cigarette? Are you afraid? Are you chicken? I have never, in my 20-something years on this earth, been pressured to smoke a cigarette. Why won't you date this uh, girl in your class who likes you? Are you a homosexual? Good thing the question was, are you a homosexual? Instead of, are you in a fucking cult? <laughs> and again, people don't talk like this. Uh, today, Satan uses intimidation. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, The devil walks about like a roaring lion. And often, those roars take the form of intimidation. Kind of like the, the roars of a literal lion, according to the Insight book, are calculated to cause domestic animals to stampede and break out of their protective enclosure. But now here's a question. What lessons can we learn from those three Hebrews that will help us to never let Satan intimidate us. It's kind of hard to draw practical lessons from a book so infused with myths and obvious fantasies where men are miraculously spared from burning to death. But sure, go on. At Luke 12, 11 and 12, Jesus said, when they bring you before public assemblies, government officials, authorities, don't be anxious about what you will say. The Holy Spirit will teach you in that hour what to say. So did the Holy Spirit inspire Jeffrey Jackson to give this response? Uh, that, I think, would seem to be quite presumptuous to, to say that uh, we are the only spokesperson that God is using. Now here's another lesson. Jehovah can use his powerful angels to rescue us from an intimidating situation. In the case of the three Hebrews, they were rescued miraculously. When the king looked into that furnace, instead of seeing three men bound being cremated, he saw four walking about freely, the fourth obviously an angel. Now when they were brought out of that uh, furnace, Daniel 3.27 says they didn't even have the smell of fire. No hair of their body was singed. Now we've been in homes where people are smokers. And uh, you pick up that smell of smoke very easily. Uh, talking about singeing your hair, uh, hair singes very easily. One eternity later. Some time back, I tried to light a gas stove uh, using a match. I didn't get the timing exactly right. <laughs> it blew back, burned about half the hairs off my arm. But here they didn't have a hair singe, not even the smell of smoke. Now today, we don't expect Jehovah's angels to deliver us miraculously. Yep, that has been made very, very clear time and time again, you insensitive clown. But Jehovah can use them to maneuver circumstances. So we find a job to provide for our family. So we find a cooperative doctor who respects our stand on blood as just a couple of examples. 
So Jehovah will command his angels to help us find a job or a doctor who's willing to let us die if we need a blood transfusion, but the angels can't protect us from physical harm? Uh, why? <laughs> what kind of sick mind games is God playing with us? Or he may use the angels to strengthen us, to be faithful in the face of that fiery test. Wait, how would that even work? How are the angels going to strengthen someone if they can't intervene directly in their behalf? Uh, whatever. Now here's another lesson we can learn. Firm belief in the resurrection can powerfully fortify us even if we're threatened with death. And think about this. If Nebuchadnezzar and other Babylonian onlookers are resurrected as part of the unrighteous mentioned in Acts 24.15, this experience will give them a head start in the new world on taking a stand with Jehovah. And think about even the, the men who threw them into the furnace who died doing so. Now, if they're resurrected, they'll be told about what happened subsequent to their untimely death. And undoubtedly, that will be an impetus toward spiritual progress in the new world. This is all pure speculation. This is just so silly. So may all of us, like those three Hebrews, be determined to never let Satan intimidate us. Jehovah promises to give all of us strength, including young ones. Oh no, here we go. Our young brother Elijah was just a teenager when he faced a life-changing situation. Here's his story. So how can we continue to be faithful in spite of our human weaknesses? Growing up, I had like absolutely no health problems at all. And I loved playing basketball, and uh, I enjoyed uh, my life in the congregation. This was a kid who had his whole life in front of him, and it was taken away in a moment. November of 2019, I was diagnosed with a massive brain tumor. I need to stop the video right here, because this has been the most depressing JW broadcast I've ever seen. I mean. Could Watchtower resort to telling a story where there is no tragic accident or disease involved? <laughs> no wonder JW life is so sad. This is the spiritual food straight from Jehovah, folks. We talked about getting the brothers from HLC there to talk to back us up with the alternatives on his card. The doctor was impressed when he asked Elijah if he had any questions. And Elijah asked him a couple of questions about the procedure and then also brought up the blood issue. Uh, this showed the doctor that this was a young man who had his own stand, his own convictions. Yeah, those are not convictions of his own. They were literally implanted by his parents, who themselves received them from Watchtower, who got it from a strange interpretation of the Bible that is exclusive to Jehovah's Witnesses. To avoid blood is like the least original thought that this boy could have had. Stupid as religion putting people at risk. Uh, if Jehovah tells me that uh, blood is sacred, and then uh, I'm listening. Bro, Jehovah didn't tell you a single thing. The interview just keeps getting more depressing, so I'm gonna spare you the suffering this time. As part of the family, would you like to see the invitation video for this year's regional convention? No, thank you, Mark. We already covered the preview in this previous video. Check it out if you haven't already. I'm really looking forward to watching that new propaganda you have in store for us. The governing body. Wow, I'm surprised this is the first time they mentioned the governing body in this JW broadcast. And how many times did they mention Jesus? Hmm, let's see. Oh. Zero. Has approved a new original song to conclude the convention. I'm happy to announce that the song and lyrics are now available for download on JW.org. All right, let's check that out real quick. We know your day will come, sure as a rising sun. No matter how long it takes, it will not be late. It will not be late, boys and girls. Keep spinning that hamster wheel. I didn't tell you to stop, damn it. The governing body requests that everyone practice before the convention. Yes, Master. So that unitedly we can sing out with all our hearts. Some will need help to download the song. 
please keep them in mind and provide help as needed. Perhaps you can even practice singing the song with them in preparation for the convention. As you can see, we have a lot to look forward to in the months ahead. Further evidence of how much Jehovah cherishes his people. Oh yes, Mark. I'm so looking forward to ripping apart all the propaganda you send my way. It's gonna be a fun summer. <laughs> well, that's the spiritual food we have for this month, guys. The indoctrination session ends with a video postcard from the beautiful country of Malta. And Mark standing awkwardly in the studio. So don't forget to let me know the exact moment you cringed. If you didn't cringe... Are you a homosexual? And while you're at it... Check me out on Patreon and Instagram. Why not? Thank you for watching, guys. Take it easy and stay away from the tower. Another year has gone by. Are you ready? Because it's convention time. I've got my bag. Love in my heart. Can't wait to be there. It's convention time to gather. You take a seat right next to me. We're taking notes. We're taking notes and singing songs. And singing songs. We have the same hope. That's why we get along. It's convention time. Together.